Uh, hi there, uh, I'm Zan Christensen. Uh, welcome to our panel. We're going to talk about queer comics, queer comics in every direction. Uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I have been working in queer comics for about a dozen years. Uh, started back in 99 or 98, 90, around the turn of the century. <laughs> Uh, on, uh, I started working on a thing called Out in Comics, which was a, a zine that Andy Mangles put out every Comic-Con, which was uh, spotlighting and promoting out queer creators, and uh, worked on that for several years. That kind of morphed into the nonprofit organization Prism Comics, uh, which has been around for 10 years now, and has been promoting LGBT people doing comics, uh, LGBT creators, LGBT characters. Uh, giving out grant monies every year uh, in the fall. Um, and uh, recently, in the past four years, I've been working as a publisher with Northwest Press, uh, publishing queer comics, because people kept coming to me when I was working with Prism saying, will you publish my book? And I'm like, we don't publish you know, books. <laughs> um, and I, I saw that there was definitely a need for an outlet for people who weren't able to find a publisher uh, who knew what to do with the work uh, and would take a chance on indie queer stuff. So, uh, so that's what I do. I want to let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, I think pretty much everybody on the panel is somebody that I've published in one form or another, either with a full book or in an anthology, uh, or in a free online <laughs> comic. Uh, and uh, so, the, just one by one, just go ahead and introduce yourselves and uh, talk about what you do and why you're here. And are we starting down here? And your favorite color and. <laughs> yeah, starts at the end. Hi, uh, I'm Rick Worley. He does publish me, like most of us. Um, I do a series of autobiographical comics called A Waste of Time. This is the most recent one, but there's been a book and a couple things out now. Um, I, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's dazzling. That's great. <laughs> uh, my name is Agnes, and I've been working on, on comics on and off for the past number of years, and I've mostly self-published, um, doing my own layout and printing, all that kind of stuff, uh, mostly in zine format. Um, yeah. I'm Tyler Cohen, and I have been in the queer anthology published by Zan, but I also self-publish my own comic, um, Prima Hood, um, more of a mini comic. I'm Ashley Guillory. I'm the official Northwest Press intern. <laughs> and it was my mini comic that was published free online. I also do a online web comic about a bro princess. Um, I'm new to comics. I'm actually in the area doing my MFA in comics at CCA. My name is David Kelly, and I've been doing comics for probably over 25 years. And I, um, in the 90s, I did a, a strip called Stevens Comics, which Dan um, collected a few years ago. It's called Rainy Day Recess. It's a complete Stevens Comics. And I'm also in the same MFA program with Ashley. Yeah. And I recently um, put together a, a new set of prints, and they're available at the Northwest Press table. So I'm John Macy, and I, um, my new book is Triple Hunter, which is the collection of uh, my self-published work. And I'm also on the board of PRISM with the Queer Press Grant. So if you're a LGBT self-publishing cartoonist and you have questions about the grant, you should talk to me afterwards. And that's it. Okay. So um, just a quick survey of the audience. Uh, who here is, uh, is a comics fan? Who reads comics? Yay, you're in the right room. <laughs> just making sure. Like, who likes Mass Effect? No, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so also, who here uh, does comics or dreams of doing comics or aspires to do comics? <laughs> awesome, wonderful. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about, like a little, kind of a little general. So we have a lot of time. I'm really glad that we have the time to just kind of stretch out because it always seems we do these panels and we're, we're just in the thick of things and we've taken a few questions and then we're done. So this time we have a little bit of time to stretch out. So I wanted to talk about, um, I definitely want to hit on some things that are useful mm. to folks who want to know um, good strategies to break into comics, good resources to tap into um, organizations and events to take advantage of, uh, and kind of pitfalls to avoid. So I did want to talk to all the panelists about how you started in comics, um, 
what it was like at the beginning. I actually, I posed the question, uh, how did you break into comics? Have you broken into comics? <laughs> um, how did you start, uh, you know, when you published your first work, what, what medium was it? Was it online? Was it zines? Like, what was it? And then um, how did you make your way to, uh, to doing more stuff and being at conventions and all that stuff? Because that's kind of like the, the dream of all of us to become impoverished and do comics. So just talk a little bit about how you got started. Um, we can keep starting at this end. Okay. Yeah. I don't do that. We can just okay. jump in and elbow your way to the front. Well, I've started, so it's too late. Um, <laughs> I, I started doing comics. I started doing a waste of com time comics where I draw myself as a cartoon rabbit character, um, basically just as a joke for my friends. I started doing it on the marker board in the break room at work. I worked at Borders, and I, you know, was doing real edgy comics, making fun of Borders. And, um, and then I started posting it on uh, MySpace back in the day. Wow. And <laughs> I would get like you know, 50 people that would see it that were all my friends. And then um, from there, I, I just, the first time I actually had something published was I just decided, I, I lived in Riverside, I decided I had to meet people that did comics because I'm horrible at self-promotion. I couldn't do it on my own. I couldn't self-publish. I just didn't even know where to start. So I, I just moved to San Francisco and like uh, started talking to my MySpace friends that had said nice things about my comics. And I met Brian Anderson, who did So Super Duper. And uh, he said he wanted to publish a collection of the strips that I had on MySpace. And from there, I went to a prison booth to show that. I met Zan, and Zan offered to publish my book a little while after that, a, a bigger book. And um, it just kind of from going out and meeting people, because I have absolutely no ability at self-promotion or, or self-publishing or anything at all. So I just kind of like make the comics and then uh, whine and complain that nobody's reading them. And then... That's an important part of it, <laughs> the process. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, people, I don't know, out of pity or something, people like Zan have been very nice to me. And that's kind of just uh, been the way that that's happened. But it's getting much more... Um, once you have sort of like your foot in the door, you start to get invited to things like this. You start to meet more people. And it's just kind of, uh, being social is just the main thing to do. I got started trying to figure out a way to promote my illustration work primarily before I did comics. And uh, one of my friends had gotten a bunch of her ink drawings and she'd just gone to Kinko's and made Xeroxes and stapled them together and was selling them as booklets. And I was like, I can do that. So I did it and I sold maybe two copies at a, one convention just kind of walking around, didn't even have a table. <laughs> um, but after a while, I started making comics, and I realized I could do the very same thing with a comic book. So I would draw my comics, I'd go to Kinko's, um, sometimes I'd have to kind of hide what I was doing, because it wasn't appropriate for children, or people, regular people to see. <laughs> and I'd make copies and staple them, and then I started signing up for tables at small conventions that seemed appropriate for what I was making, um, which was a lot of like gay romance stories at the time. Um, and putting it up online, and that was a big thing, putting up online where other similar fans, artists could see it, and then talking to all of them, and making those connections. Um, and then when I actually started doing much longer, more involved stories, I already had a bit of an audience for my illustration and um, shorter comics work. Um, and through all these connections with the artist, I also got included in a couple of short comics anthologies, which helped me a lot because people already knew those people's names and they'd buy the book and they'd see my work and they recognize it when they came across me at a table or looking online at various stuff. Um, so that was an easy, good way to get started. Anyone can do it. Anyone can make Xerox copies and staple them together and hand them out or sell them. Yeah, that is the cool thing about comics is that anyone can do them. Um, and I think a lot of people start out doing mini comics. That certainly I, um, I, I've always loved the medium of comics. And then back in the mid 90s or so, I started meeting other mini comics people and learning from them. And so I started making mini comics in the late 90s, early aughts, but then I shifted over more to fine art gallery spaces, but then I came back to books because comics are the art of the proletariat. <laughs> um, no, really, you can reach, you can just reach more people. Um, and also, if your stuff is edgy, it's people are more likely to buy a comic than buy something that they might never hang on their wall. Um, but yeah. Uh, I really feel like the best shows for starting out are more like zine fests and smaller comic spaces, um, the smaller, more alternative, because 
Uh, your work gets drowned out in the big glossy environments, especially when you're learning to do it, but also it's about meeting people and zine fests um, and mini comic shows are a great way to meet other artists and that's really, I don't know about breaking in, I feel like breaking in is like being bisexual, you have to keep coming out over and over and over again. Um, same thing about comics, it's if you're not doing it, you're not doing it. If you're there, you're there. And so if you're there, you're meeting people. If you're making comics, you're making comics. Otherwise, you kind of don't exist, which is harder if you're doing a long-term project. Yeah. So. What was the transition like um, straddling the world between fine art worlds and comics worlds? And, and was there any bleed over? Was there any overlap there? Well, a, a lot of, OK, here's the thing. Is you either meet people who get what you do, or you meet people who don't get what you yeah. do. And in the, I did um, an MFA program, and I had a lot of trouble finding artists who even knew how to critique my work, even though I wasn't necessarily being linear or clearly sequential. I was using an iconic language, which is intrinsic to comics, and a lot of people just didn't know what to do with it. And I got a lot of people, I would get uh, teachers even saying, drop narrative. I'm like, but I am narrative. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually ended up befriending people in the writing programs, and that's where I would actually get more, and then, you know, I would find individuals, individual yeah. artists who would get it. So. But then in, in comics, my stuff can be kind of arty, and so then comics people don't always know what to do with my work either. So, you know, I, I've always had a foot in more than one world. That just seems to be the way I walk through it, but I feel like comics is an interdisciplinary medium just by its nature, so, and if you take comics as a medium and not as a genre, it should be open to all different ways of exploring the language, yeah. or languages. Mm -hmm. Ashley, how did you break into comics? How did, I'm working on it, <laughs> but I've received some really great advice. Um, making your first mini, because anybody can make a comic. You right now, you could be making a comic right now. What are you doing? So staple something together and take it to a show, and always trade with everyone. If someone brings you their comic, validate them with your Co their comic, I'll trade them because you never know who they're going to be. One of my very best friends in the MFA comics program met Ed Luce, who has been published by Zan, yeah. and he makes Wolfable Oaf, which you, if you haven't read it, you're really missing out. Um, and she still remembers when they did their first trade, and he vaguely remembers the occurrence, <laughs> but it, it stuck with her because she was like, I'm validated, I'm a comics artist now, this is what it means, and it's just getting your foot in the door and getting to know people, really. That evil word networking is ugh, but it, <laughs> it's applicable in the situation, so. So, and if you haven't checked out uh, Brohim on, on yes. tum Tumblr, you can find it on Tumblr, right? You can find it on Tumblr, and mm -hmm. there's a, like a whole Brohime website yeah. also. So. Brohime. 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 It's Sorry. okay. No, it's all good. Brohan. 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 Um, well, I guess um, I have always been doing comics, even since I was like eight years old. So I think I've been doing it for over 40 years now. Um, and even in college, I tried to do comics as an illustration major, and it didn't really work out that well. <laughs> and so then after that, um, I just kind of, I knew I was always wanted to do comics, so I just started drawing like these strips or semi-autobiographical strips. And eventually I started submitting them to like gay weekly newspapers. And I got uh, picked up like by the Washington Blade and um, some other papers, even like non-gay papers like Philadelphia What's Weekly. What's a right? newspaper? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was um, a great learning experience because um, since they were weekly or bi-weekly, I had deadlines, or, um, so I really had to keep going on the strip. And also, it was a good experience like, to find out like, who will pay you and who you won't. Like, I had, had newspapers that would run my strip, but then I never received any payment. And so, um, but, that's, that's very comics. Yeah, that's yeah. That's very comics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the best part about it was probably meeting other um, gay cartoonists like Robert Kirby and Alison Bechdel, who had been so um, helpful to me over the years. So um, I guess that's how I broke in. Yeah. Well, I, used, I did the tried and true method of going to the conventions and just bugging everybody. But <clears throat> actually, I didn't bug them. I, I uh, wouldn't even mention that I did comics. I would just be social, like Rick said, and just um, made uh, relationships, started that way, just out of being common. But back in 1990 at Comic-Con, um, 
if you were out, you were pretty much ostracized. So I was very lucky that um, through friends, um, I got picked up by a straight publisher who was a very small press, but it gave me my chance. And then um, I moved on to Fantagraphics. And if you apply for Fantagraphics, Gary Groth reads everything. So use really big words. <laughs> he, I called him the inimitable Gary Groth, and he <laughs> loved it. He just eats that up. Did so, you work that into your comic, or what? Like that's, that would be great. Like, oh, and the starts of the splash page has the inimitable Gary it Groth. Should, I, like, that would be great. Someday. <clears throat> so uh, he was just charmed by my vocabulary, I guess. And, um, but he, he was a great ally in that he was willing to take a chance on very, very queer work. So, um, and then uh, years, years later, we, Justin Hall and I, after, uh, what was it, WonderCon? Um, I might have been after We kept you up something. all night and bullied you. Yes. Bullied you into yes. becoming a publisher. Because you were talking about being a comic, op opening a comic shop or I something? I dodged that bullet. God. <laughs> oh my God, I can't imagine. So it was, um, no, no yeah, we just sat on him because he had the perfect hard. skill set. He just didn't, he need, I don't know. So I, and I needed a publisher that, um, I mean, I could have gone back to, you know, like, because I dreamed of being with the big three, you know, when I was a little baby cartoonist. And I uh, did not get the support and, and drive that I get from smaller presses. Because they really, if they take you on, it's because they really love your book. It's not that they're looking, you know, to make uh, for our cash cow. So I found that my relationship with smaller presses has been w way more rewarding than um, any of the larger ones. Yeah. So. I did want to talk about, a little bit about, speaking about, because um, both you and, uh, and David started quite a while ago in, in comics, in queer comics terms. Uh, and I did want to talk a little bit about how, um, how the marketplace has changed, like the community has changed because uh, I'm sure that a lot of you have noticed that queer bookstores are just like every so often you see another new story that another store is closed, another store is closed, another store is closed. Like the store I went to in DC closed. Uh, there's only one queer bookstore left in New York City. Like I mean, it, it's, uh, it's kind of simultaneously uh, a sign that um, queerness isn't ghettoized and isn't pushed into uh, specialized spaces, it's kind of everywhere and everybody at this, at this point, everybody is familiar and everybody is more uh, open and, and willing to have the conversations and willing to mingle with everybody and that's great, but um, when you're looking for something, when you're looking for uh, people who are knowledgeable about queer work, uh, those spaces are disappearing. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, if that similar thing that's kind of a positive, like a sign of progress, but also kind of a, you know, we're, we, we kind of mourn it a little bit, the loss of those spaces, um, is the queer comics landscape experiencing any of that? Because we've had some kind of big breakout hits. There's been a lot of books that have kind of made it through in kind of mainstream publishers and mainstream audiences um, that are queer themed, but that are not being marketed as queer books, or maybe that are kind of transcending the queer comics community. Um, do you see that, or do you, uh, do you see that kind of evolving toward that? Just say yes or no. <laughs> I, yes. I think it's, it's more I see complicated yes. than that. I think so, it's more complicated than that, because yeah. when you're mourning, you're also mourning a particular community that you've come up in, and yeah. I think that younger people are experiencing spaces and queerness differently than, yeah. you know, old people like me. Mm -hmm. um, and me. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's also the fact that the publishing industry as a whole is changing and book publishing yeah. is changing and there's a lot of bookstores, period, that are closing and going away. So I think that's a really huge part of it, not just about how the community is changing, it's just publishing is kind of, it's becoming a completely different animal. Nobody quite knows what it is or where it's going. Nobody knows what the future holds. We're kind of stumbling around in the dark and I think that's having a, a huge impact on it might look to us like maybe the communities, like our queer community is changing or the support networks are dying out where it's maybe it's just book publishing. That's, <laughs> what, I, that's publishing. what I suspect. I picked the right career. This is great. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Woo! No, but I, I do think that that's a, uh, the next step and I think it's a good thing mm -hmm. that, I mean, we still need Northwest Press. We still need, you know, because it's a long, long way from being there. We still do need specialized gay things. Mm -hmm. But it's a really good thing when 
It used to be every time that there was a gay kiss or something in Marvel or DC, it was like a news story and people went all crazy about it and why are they ruining the world? And there's been a couple now where people didn't really care. And I think that that's the goal. That's a good thing, <laughs> right? And I think that um, you, you could do, hopefully, we're like almost there, where you can do stuff that's very, very gay, but I don't see why straight people can't read it, you know, because, I mean, I, I read stories every day that have only straight characters, and that's fine, because I don't need to, you know, you read, you don't need to see somebody exactly like you in fiction to, uh, to understand the fiction or to enjoy the fiction. And also, when you read fiction, you should be looking to see things that you don't see in your own life and to learn about other people's lives. And so, you know, they, if we can, it's getting to the point where it's not quite so newsworthy every time there's a gay kiss. But if we could get to the point where straight people actually read like explicitly gay, you know, stuff that's almost only gay characters in it, but there's no reason that you can't read this. When we get, I think that's sort of like maybe one more little step. Do you see some of that happening? I've Are you seen samples of that, examples of that. I've seen little bits, just not enough. I, I still see people that are very nice and that wouldn't ever see themselves as homophobic and they look at my book for two seconds and they see that there's like naked dudes doing naked dudes and <laughs> they're like okay that, that's oh your drawing's really good but then it's but it's not for me <laughs> like it's you know okay that's so oh, the, they still they have the idea that it's like oh it's so it's for that specialized gay audience and it's not it's for somebody else and not even if they have a problem with it just that it's for somebody else yeah. which is sort of like I, I think that that's a thing that we need to move past yeah do you but, think that's it, the rest of the panel as well, do you think it's like a marketing thing more than a content issue? Because like, the work is not necessarily changing, but it's the audiences and, and the way that, that we talk about the work might change. I know, we have direct access to the authors now. To, yeah. So people from whatever they're, whatever they're looking for, they can go directly to that, that author. So you, you could market it in any way you want in multiple ways. So. I, think, I think that um, Alison Bechtel's Fun Home is the book that I think of when I think of a queer book that sort of transcends. When I meet people and they're like, oh, you do graphic novels, you do comics, yeah. have you read Alison Bechtel? I'm right. like, have, what, have you read Alison mm -hmm. Bechtel? And, and that book, for people who don't know, um, that was Time Magazine's book of the year in 2007. Not graphic novel, not queer book, but book of the year 2007. So. That's quite an achievement, and that right. transcends the category completely. Right? Yeah. And they made it into a Broadway show, off Broadway. <laughs> so exciting. Yeah. And so that book definitely is a good example. Mm -hmm. And I think with um, vanity publishing, which is a terrible word, but like mm -hmm. Kickstarter now, yeah. well, you don't have physical queer spaces online, definitely. You can directly market to your audience mm -hmm. and find people that way. Which sucks if you like live in an area like mine where you don't know where any other queer people are to hang out with, but mm. you know. Also, you mentioned Ed Luce. Like he just got signed with Fantagraphics yes. to do Ed, uh, Wobble Oaf collection, which is pretty awesome. So, and that's going to be definitely a wider audience for him because he, it's kind of uh, bare metal. Morrissey, I, I don't know. I, it's just, it's so uncategorizable and, and, and wonderfully so. And adorable. And the audience, like the makeup of the audience for that is like guys who love kind of like um, trailer parky humor and like um, kind of gross out stuff. People who like Johnny Ryan also like Ed Luce, which is so amazing. That's a, that's a perfect example, because the first time I ever saw it, Luce is like, I knew it was very well drawn, but it was like, I, from the first glances, it's a bear comic. Yeah. And I, I'm not into bears, I like twinks, you know, and I was like, <laughs> so I just thought, oh, okay, well, this is a bear comic, it's for the bears. And, you know, but once I actually took a minute and looked at it, it's so much more. Mm -hmm. And it's great, and it doesn't matter, you know, and, and I love R. Crumb, I don't like giant butted women, you know, but it, it's, R. Crumb's still great. That's, Ed Luce is a good analogy to that. Mm -hmm. So um, speaking of demographics, uh, has anyone ever um, delved into kind of your, who your audiences are, kind of in broad strokes, like what kind of communities they belong to, and what kind of how they identify, and been surprised at what you found? Yes. Yes. Actually, I found the surprise <laughs> was the, uh, <laughs> the amount of women who want to read gay erotica. So. <laughs> Is that surprising? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> my, so my my web comic Brohime, I it's about bros, but it's really not. Like there's a whole bunch of like the main character is asexual. That's not really alluded to. There's a les bro. Everybody's like friends. <laughs> they all hang out in this, and like Bizbro has two moms. It's very. But I found that according to Google, 
my demographic, like 50% of my readers, is between 18, year old and 18 and 35 year old males who really likes sports, <laughs> which in my mind is like bros, like bros read my bro comic, which I think is hysterical. I don't understand. That's great. Yeah, That's thank awesome. you. So. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, so talking again about um, like the Ed Luce comics. So like there's lots of music and lots of like heavy metal and there's lots of like topics that are not about queer relationships and whatever, while not um, shying away in any way from romance and the kind of intricacies and the weirdnesses of queer culture. Um, but if we have a story, uh, if you're doing a, a graphic novel, for instance, and you're doing it about a topic, like about war or about, the examples I have like war or politics or farming are the three examples that I came up with. Because I wanted to be as, like, as, as broad as possible and kind of, uh, anyway. Um, if you're doing a story like that, either an ongoing story or a graphic novel, and your story is including queer characters as central characters and, um, and possibly romance and possibly family uh, dynamics and whatever, um, d where, where does it end up? What section does it end up in? Or are there, since there's no bookstores anymore, are there no sections? Or is this, is this being solved for us by eliminating sections altogether? <laughs> Uh, or how do, you, how do you communicate that without um, letting audiences kind of pigeonhole, like Rick was saying, like they're uh, deciding it's not for them, even though the general topic might be interesting, but feeling that, well, it's through a lens that they can't understand or that they don't think is aimed at them. Like, how do you, how do we do that? Well, even with just putting the tags on your, on your work, uh -huh. you've automatically, during the library system, you've put yourself in multiple categories. Right. So I, I think the answer is just it goes everywhere. That. So just hope the library buys two copies is your answer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, OK. That would be great. That would be really wonderful. Do you, do you mean like in bookstores, or like as far as how you market it more? Kind of in bookstores. and kind of, I mean, I think that um, it's less and less an issue maybe in bookstores because the um, they're not really the go-to for a lot of people in terms yeah. of, I mean, maybe even in comic book stores. Like, the, that's even less categorized, though. But I'm, I, I guess the answer, the question I'm, I'm trying to drive at is, uh, how, do you, how do you telegraph to people who maybe want representation? Of, to, they want to see themselves in the book, or they want to see themselves in the comics that they read um, without inadvertently telling other people that it's not what they want to read. Well, I, I like what John said about the, the idea of sort of tags like you would in a, in a Tumblr post or something like that. Um, if you use a few different words, it automatically slots your category into, I mean, your book into a whole bunch of different categories. Kind of like if you open a traditional print book and you go to that one page as the publishing info, sometimes they'll actually have like the topics in the book, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know if anyone, even people who still use the library, if they know or remember that. <laughs> that is really old school. But, um, you know, you can sort of use the description to communicate to people, you know, like, two men travel in the desert and find love. And it's, like, kind of obvious that, you know, obviously you're going <laughs> to fall in love with each other. But if you want to read a story about people trekking through the desert, you can check that book out also. So I always, when I would describe my work, I would frequently mention, like, sort of, like, what happens with the characters, you know. Two characters in a circus, well, two guys in a circus fall in love while, you know, learning a new routine or whatever. That sounds really boring, but there's more to it. But you kind of drop in the, the queer theme in the description of what's actually happening so that if people want to read a book about the circus, they can pick it up. If they want to read a gay romance, they can pick it up. But I mean, you get the, it's on the author to pitch to whoever they're going for. Mm -hmm. It's like, why is this important to you? And then, but I find being put on different lists that are radically different. So I've got gay romance, but I've also got druids. And so I would go to Celtic sites, and I'll put my gay romance in there. <laughs> and um, but the bigger the like, if it was just a history mm -hmm. tag, and you're going for that, then that's a that could be a huge pool, and you can just be this little tiny. You don't stand out as much, I think, than in a more the more specific you are, the, and the smaller the pond, the more you shine. A little. Okay. But it doesn't hurt to be like if you go to if you're the only cartoonist at a at a. Farmers market. I mean, you're gonna. That. I knew that, that would. I knew that farming example would be yes, useful. You're gonna, I knew it. You're gonna stand out so like the sore thumb, and you're gonna attract attention, um, in, in a, usually in a good way, because you're like so unexpected. And even 
even like when we went, we were at AWP in Seattle recently, and the only comics booth, and we were like a unicorn. Like yeah. we were like, oh my god, I didn't know that comics people were here, and it didn't matter that we were a queer comics publisher. We had people coming up and asking about how to break into comics. What what books should I read to make comics? And so. Yeah. Yeah, that, there are not a lot of disco balls at AWP booths. No. <laughs> this no. is a writers and publishers conference. It's very dry. Very dry. dry. I do. Th I think when I when I worked at Borders, it was like the, the the gay fiction section was actually a huge problem as far as categorizing things. I, it would have been much more necessary probably a couple days ago when there was so little and people were really searching for it. But uh, you know, Fun Home that Borders did not know what the hell to do with Fun Home. I think they had Fun Home in the lesbian fiction section and they had Dykes to watch out for, was in memoirs or some such. <laughs> and I think that they, they just didn't know at all where to put it. And it became kind of a thing of, um, that was a, the place that you only went if you were specifically just looking for that. Like, uh, you know, um, so it kind of became the place where you put like, bad gay stuff or stuff that they were kind of cute, like they were worried if a straight person saw it, they might get upset. Mm -hmm. Because like if you're a Truman Capote, you got to be on the literature wall. Uh -huh. So it wasn't actually, oh, we're putting all the gay authors here. It was kind of like we're putting the gay authors here that were kind of like, I don't, I don't know if I want that book over in the other place. That's okay. sort of what, what it became in a big chain books or like that. Was it also maybe that those are the books they thought that was their main draw or their main point was that they were catering to a queer audience? Yeah, well, it, yes and no. I mean, that, that's, that's sort of ostensibly what they were supposed to be doing, but it became more of a, more of a value judgment. Mm -hmm. And that was the way they did with a lot of their, their stuff. Once you got like a certain recognition level, you got to go to the literature wall. Uh -huh. You know, like Anne Rice, <laughs> Anne Rice wasn't in horror. She was in literature. Uh -huh. And I think uh, Diana Gabaldon, or however you say her name, she has like those Outlander books, those big fat things. They were in romance. And then literally they got like some notable reviews and things and so then they got to be on the literature wall. We jumped them out of romance. <laughs> and so it became really, it was like a value judgment. I think that if, if there's gay stuff on the literature wall, gay people find it anyway. Because you, you, can, you can figure it out. Yeah. It jumps out to you. Yeah, I, actually you talking about Borders reminds me how it used to be if I go into a bookstore like Borders and I go to the gay and lesbian section, it was almost all like erotica and how to have gay sex books, you know, which is, <laughs> it, it, which can Step be useful, one. like that makes them easy to find. But It's like, it's like frat party seven with, with like the guy in the chalk strap. That, I, that didn't, I didn't buy that one. But, that, that was you know, the gay fiction <laughs> section. That was. Yeah, but, but I mean, like, it's, since everything's so digital, it's like it doesn't even matter where it is in the bookstore. You go to the computer and you type in, like, beep, beep, boop, I want, you know, Alison Bechdel's work, or I want some lesbian comics, and then it'll show you, like, books in seven different sections, but whatever, you'll go find them. So it's, like, I feel like the, the ways of categorizing books, like, uh, digitally makes it a lot easier to find, or go, being able to search descriptions makes it a lot easier to find. I feel like all this, like, uh, bookstore section stuff, it's, like... Man, that that's that was important ten years ago. That no is no longer relevant because there's so many different ways to find the books, even if you're looking in a physical bookstore. Awesome. Cross referencing. Cross referencing. Um, speaking of sex, ooh. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the role of sex in queer comics. <laughs> Just stare, at John. I'm sorry, John. Um, uh, so. Here's a funny story. Uh, in 2004, uh, Prism Comics solicited comics uh, to be in an anthology section. They used to do uh, an, annual print, an annual print guide to what was going on in queer comics, and it had profiles, and it had you know, like articles and interviews and things like that, uh, and they were adding a, an anthology section at the back. And so, because it was gonna be given out for free, um, the, the call was, was worded such that um, the work should be safe for all ages. And there was a lot of discussion that that generated um, because some creators noted, they, they said that it was absurd to, um, to seemingly appease the straight world by removing sex or the hint of sex, uh, kind of lasciviousness from the picture entirely uh, and kind of eliminate that part of queer culture, which is, is, is obviously like sex positivity and, and kind of trying to challenge kind of puritanical norms about sex is, is very central to a lot of people's work. So I wanted to pose a question to the panel to see um, whether uh, you feel that queer cartoonists should seek to bring more sex positivity to their work and more body positivity to their work, um, or is there a lot of value in 
doing something like an Archie comic or something like a children's comic or something like that that is uh, living exactly like a really good example of that genre or that uh, target market that it's in with just queer characters and like what the how those two things I mean of course they can both be they can both happen but what are your thoughts on those uh, I think it's it's a fantastic thing to have all ages comics with queer characters um, I can understand why that would upset a lot of people because you have to wonder, is this like censorship of the queer community to sanitize it or is this something that would have happened to straight sub, you know, submissions of this type too? Like, don't show any sex, you know? Um, but there, you have to have work that's accessible to people of all ages. I think it's really important for kids to have um, material that's safe and easy for them to read, easy to understand, that portrays obviously queer characters in a positive light. And it also separates queerness from sex um, I know that it's important for, for everyone to, it's important for us to show queer sex as normal and happy and healthy, but we also want to sometimes kind of extract our identity from that. Like it's not all about sex and that frequently that's how it gets portrayed, you know, in popular media is that it's all about like which genitals you mess with or what have you, you know, <laughs> it's not, it's not a larger um, identity. It's, it's, I mean, it's also about romance. It's about what culture we belong to. It's about experiences we have in our lives as queer people that straight people don't have. And all that stuff is really important. And in many ways, it's import more important than showing queer people having sex in a comic. So yes, I think there's definitely a place. I'm going to add to that. I think that, um, and also two things. One is, is sex necessary for the story? Is it part of the story? Or is sex the story? Which sometimes it is. But sometimes, you know, it's part of the story. And sometimes it's, doesn't, it's not what your, the story's about. Um, but I think that just having queer folk as just characters in the story um, is really necessary for kids and young people because this is looking at our, who's in your world, who's in the story, just like it's important to have um, characters of color in the story. There's who's in the world, who's in the story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have a kid and I, you know, she will read pretty much any comics I leave lying around. So I do have to think about which ones are left on the couch. I'm not the, you know, as an artist, I'm not necessarily the tidiest person because I got things to get to. Um, so for example, recently she was reading um, Charlie and Finn are Hitched, which is um, uh, by Tony Breed. And it's an online comic, but he puts it out in collections. And it's, it's really sweet. It's mostly about the lives of the characters and just how they interact. And it's kind of a domestic uh, relationship yeah. comedy, kind of a domestic comedy. Yeah, comedy. yeah, and it's it's going more ensemble, so it's it's um, there's other lives in there now and such. But you know, she she loves it, and I would have thought she would have been bored by it. But you know, I don't. That's good. She's another person. I have no idea what her tastes are going to be. Um, but the ones that show really really graphic sex, you know, I figure she doesn't really need to see that yet. But if she does, she'll come up to with her own understanding of what it means because kids don't understand sex like adults understand sex. So, um, you know, they already, they don't get what they don't get and they don't, whatever. But anyway, back to the point, they need to see people in the world, <laughs> just right. representation. And I think that that's really important in, as far as gay representation in general and adult stuff too because that's the main argument that people have against it or gay people being affectionate in public or whatever. It's like, well, now I have to talk to my kid about sex. I have to teach my kid about, <laughs> no, why? Because they, <laughs> well, they saw two people holding hands, so. Don't what take your kid to the Dory Alley street fair. Right. Or, 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 or Folsom Street, you know, like just, you know. Just I mean, they gotta learn bit. sometime, but that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a different discussion. But it, that, that, that's, that's their biggest argument about gay representation is like, oh my God, my kid saw a gay character in a sitcom and now, we had to have this horrible talk, you know, which, you know, it, it, it's only a horrible talk if you make it have something to do with sex, which isn't necessary. Yeah. So do you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that there's levels of intimacy that people would consider sex. So if you see, you know, like in the 50s, they couldn't have a married couple in the same bed. You know, we're working through these kind of social mores where now it's like, even without a penetration shot, I mean, if you have, um, people just naked together, not showing anything, that it would still really offend somebody somewhere. Mm -hmm. And a lot and of- the, And the standards and, might be different 
based on the identities, of, like the, the genders of the, of the people. Sure. So like if you have men and women together, it might evoke feelings of like, ah, romance and, and tenderness and passion. Mm -hmm. And if it, there's two men or two women, uh, it might make people freak or out. Or their race or their, their well, you age. You need to normalize right. that. You need to right. normalize, you know, if it's just lying in bed there, cuddling or something, so what? Yeah. Right? I mean, that's, that's okay. So there's lots of different shapes of love. And that's not, doesn't have to be a scary thing. It's just a normal thing. Yeah. I just personally, I think I would really challenge creators to, if you want that in your story, do not hesitate to put it in. Don't worry about your distributor. Uh, but there's times when you have to worry about even your printer. Is someone on the, on the line? I mean, your printer will take on your job. And then as they're printing it out, somebody, uh, an employee from that company, may suddenly become very uncomfortable with your work. And then you're, you miss your <laughs> deadline with your distributor, and you're screwed. You know? yeah. So um, it's, it's a very serious thing to think about. But to just sanitize your work out of fear is just then nothing ever changes. So I do want to talk to you about, about this topic. Uh, what are the challenges in doing an all ages comic? Because you were doing a, a, a strip that was, it wasn't really a children's comic. It wasn't really necessarily um, in, a, in a, like it was in newspapers that were for queer folks of all ages, um, right. while mostly adults. Um, uh -huh. But it was definitely a, and a very accessible comic. It was not, it didn't have graphic sex, it didn't have any violence, it didn't have any bad words, it didn't have any strong language. Mm -hmm. um, what were the challenges in doing that, and how do you get around the barriers that a lot of people have to letting young people see queer content and see queer characters? Um, well, first, of the reason I guess I, I, I did an all-ages comic was because when I was probably, um, well, I bought comics you know, as a teenager and things like that and got a little bit older, and I was looking for gay comics, but they were mainly geared towards adults, and they're fairly explicit, and at that time, I guess I didn't have a boyfriend, wasn't having sex or anything, so they were kind of another, it was another world to me. So I wanted to um, find, a, a, I guess, a, a, an outlet to tell stories that were gay, but that weren't about gay sex, I guess. Um, and so I created the, the Stevens Comics character. Um, I think it was, um, kind of, it was kind of a, a unique experience, actually, to, to do an all-ages comic and be placed with Right, you know, Stevens Comics sitting right next to Meat Men or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I don't know. I think it, especially over the probably the last um, 15 years or so, I think it's it's changed a lot as far as you know, um, people seeing my book and and feeling okay about kids reading it. But probably when I was first doing the strip and they were appearing in the in the weekly newspapers. Um, I think that kind of probably labeled it, oh, it's gay, I don't, you know, it's probably not good for kids to read or something. So I think, and that's kind of like my goal. I, I have done other more adult comics and I, I co-edited an anthology called Boy Trouble, which I kind of use as my outlet to tell more adult type stories. But I think um, like as a cartoonist, my, I, it's a youth audience and a young adult audience that I, I guess I kind of relate to most and that's, um, Actually, what I'm working on now is more of um, stuff for all ages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so oh, I also just want to add and remember yeah. that some of those kids are not going to grow up to be um, straight. So, yeah. well, yeah, that's that's part of the of the, why it's important because you you can't people you can't expect people to magically appear at at you know 15 years old, oh, yeah. fully formed, and know what know who they are. You know, without any examples or any guidance. You know. Um, I would, I'm going to plug asexual here because mm -hmm. I feel like there are not a lot of comics that it's like, it's okay to not have those feelings. If you don't mm -hmm. have those feelings, there are plenty of people that don't. So mm -hmm. there, there, there are coming up. Yeah. There's some books that, coming that's up. That's up and coming. Let's make yeah. that our next push. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so um, what opportunities are there that you can recommend to people in terms of um, uh, uh, either places they can go or conventions they can do or uh, grant programs, wink, wink, that they can uh, take advantage of um, to help get their work out there and to, to get that networking, to get that support. All right, let's get, let's let's get, get right Prism out of the way right here. So, yeah. so Prism is the nonprofit for LGBT comics. And uh, they provide a uh, booth space at most, a lot of conventions. And they like people to come in and sign their books. 
and it's very, very important that when people come up to the booth that they see somebody like themselves. So we've been really putting out the call for a whole variety of, of creators. And you may not think because you've done like a little zine or something and that doesn't make you like a pro. No, it makes you a pro. You're doing, you're doing the work. And so um, contacting PRISM, volunteering with them is a really good way to meet everyone at the con. It's going to be the hub of uh, where everyone's going to go looking for queer comics. Then there's also, um, so you create relationships that'll last your lifetime. And then there's the grant. And the grant um, goes to one person, two if there's a split. I wouldn't mind doing it. If we could wrangle it, I would love to do two people a year. But the, um, uh, it's uh, $2,000. And it's mainly to go to print costs. So we're looking for people who, they've got a, a nice chunk of work. They've got this graphic novel. It's almost done or it's done. The only thing holding them back is they can't afford the money to print. And that's the people that we really would love to see. So if it was a, something where I have this idea, I haven't started it yet, that probably wouldn't um, be our first choice. But it's a, the grant is also like, so only one person a year usually gets it. But that doesn't mean that, I mean, you, uh, there's so many great projects that we want to read through the proposals. And I personally, I love taking them under my wing, and I'll help them any way I can. And even just getting profiles on um, the website is a good way for people to find you. Mm -hmm. But coming to, but nothing is better than being, sitting there physically at the booth and meeting people. And it's so exciting to talk to creators. And uh, the readers love meeting the people behind the books a lot. So showing up is, is the, um, the biggest thing you could do. Go to cons, do smaller cons. Mm -hmm. there, in Seattle, we have Geek Girl Con, which is fabulous. And, if, and get, a, get a booth. And if you can't afford one, find someone to split it with you. Definitely. Teaming up at booths is the best thing to do. And then you have a table buddy, yeah. and you can get a booth, babe. You can go to the bathroom. <laughs> you can get someone to get you lunch. Yeah. It's important. And just um, in a... Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Just, just in general, in comics, one thing that I had to learn was the like relative size of the comic world. Uh, don't be afraid to like go up to people and talk to them if you like their work or if you think that they, you like what they publish, if they're a publisher, because... I had this moment when I started doing comics, I posted something on a, a message board at, I don't know, CBR or something, and I said I liked a joke that was in an issue of Birds of Prey. And like 10 minutes later, Gail Simone posts like, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And that like blew my mind <laughs> that like, the, you know, that that's how close you are to the people that make comics. Yeah. It's not like, like when I like, if, you know, I, I love Star Wars, and I post on a Star Wars message board, George Lucas doesn't come and talk to you about it. <laughs> that's not what happens. But with comics, you, uh, 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 mega hit blockbuster indie comics sells like what, 3,000 copies or 4,000, mm -hmm. you know. So that's a very different thing just in terms of scale and you can talk to these people. I'm after a few years of kind of building connections and whatever, I'm like, I'm not even good at social media, but I'm online friends with, you know, all the creators that I like, everybody that I love their work. And they're very open to it if you're not like a creep that wants to be part of their life. If you want to talk to them about comics or be respectful and not try to steal their time, then they, they, they're totally open to it. Just do it. Just talk to the people. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say, um, the small press expos are fantastic, and there's a whole bunch of them around the country. There's literally small press expo, there's Stumptown, there's TCAF in Toronto, there's APE here um, in San Francisco. But there's also, like, even smaller ones, like ZineFest or East Bay, what was it, East Bay Lit? Book and Zine Fest, they change the name. It's always super long, and I can't remember. <laughs> um, but there's even little, little tinier ones that cost even like less money than a small press expo. They have an like even tomorrow. lower barrier to entry, and it's much easier to get a table. So uh, Google, you know, lit fairs, zine fairs, etc. And those places are totally open to queer comics. They're very much about like counterculture and self-publishing and radical stuff, and they will not blink at any content you want to sell most of the time, unless they're specifically like make it friendly to all kids. And in which case, they probably just say, check ID if you're selling something dirty. you know. But it, th those places are fantastic because they're 
there, there's no expectation that you're going to have something mainstream or superhero or whatever. They are very much focused on personal stories and creative stories and all kinds of alternative stuff. And they tend to be very welcoming. Generally, if you're making something, you're welcomed in the space like, hey, yay, another maker. Um, and you don't have to be awesome. you just happy to have you there because you're making stuff. Um, and so I'm just going to push tomorrow. There's a, there's a small zine show, Bookish Beasts, at the San Francisco Center for Sex and Culture. And it's, I think it's free entry. Um, yeah. The other nice thing about the Zine Fests and the other small comic expos is they tend to have cheaper table uh, costs. <laughs> yeah. So when you're first starting out, that's really important because I still, my goal every year is not even to make my expenses or the printing costs of the books, it's literally just to cover the table. And so the cheaper tables are really good. Especially, I mean, if you're not going to do something that's going to be a mass market hit, you know, you, you're not going to sell a lot. Of, uh, that's okay though, because every the sales that you do make really matter because they're from someone who actually want your book. And that's the other great thing about the small, um, like these guys are saying, small shows is you get to talk to people. And you know, a lot of comics creators, a lot of creative folks in general, a lot of us are introverts, and we spend most of our time <laughs> alone working on our stuff. And you know, half the time don't even know how to talk to other people. But. Um, <laughs> At these shows, you have a context in which to talk. You have people who are interested in um, similar things, so it's a great chance to be able to talk about the things that you love, whether it's the content or the form of what you're doing. So, and that's we're, that's a big part of the networking. Yeah, we're, honestly, we're, oh, sorry. Go ahead. And if you are like a little more introverted or quiet about your work, I suggest like having someone who is not as introverted or something <laughs> sit next to you, and then they'll attract the people and they'll say, "Hey, read David Kelly's book or yeah. something." Like yeah, that. selling each other's work <laughs> is is a is a tried and true it's uh, easier. tactic. It's easier to it sell works someone great. else's work than your work. Yeah, yeah some of us it's much easier for us to sell. Yeah, yeah, for us to, t to rave about somebody else's work, and it also just looks better <laughs> to have somebody else rave about your work. Um, I did want to um, um, follow up a little bit uh, with uh, John mentioned about the grant. Um, so there, the grant is, and it's not a huge amount of money, but it's a, it's a can be a big chunk if you're doing a, a, a small press project. Um, but even if you don't, uh, if you're not the recipient, because there can be like 50, 60 applicants every year. Um, I, f I found um, the, the best advice I could give people when they were applying, because I'm, I'm no longer really involved with PRISM anymore. I still am on the, on the voting um, membership of the, uh, the grant every year, uh, if, I'm, if I have the time to do it. Um, but one thing I always recommend to people is um, the business plan is probably the most important part of that um, process, because what it does is it takes you out of your hobby mentality and into a professional realm. It changes your thinking. Uh, it, it, de it demands of you to think of your comics work as something that might make you a living. <laughs> and I know that's fantasy, it's crazy. Um, but um, just changing that, it, it, it makes you think more, not about the work you're gonna make, because you're gonna make the work you're gonna make based on what you're driven to do, uh, and what's important to you, what your passions are. But in terms of once you're done with it, it really does make you think a lot more about um, how to make any money that you're gonna spend on promoting it or uh, outreach, how to make that money stretch really, really far, uh, all the things that you can do for no cost or very, very little cost, um, and it, it makes you stretch to, to make it a success, to at least make it um, so that it does cover your costs so that you can continue to work, because that's the goal, is that we want to get somebody started, give them enough money to get started. It's kind of kickstartering in a way, kind of kickstarting them. That might catch on. Um, um, to keep you, to get you started and then keep you going. And so um, definitely uh, imagine that you can do it as a, as a living. That would be my, my advice. Yeah. The, um, the financial part of the proposal is usually the scariest part for most cartoonists. And they really, really they'll, they'll start it and then they'll get really frustrated or scared. And the, the thing is that we want you to succeed. So we want you to really think about your plan. It's not something where we're like judging, you know, like how good that plan is. We just want you to make sure that you've thought it through and you've got the nuts and bolts of, of publishing and pricing and distributing like yeah. kind of down, just enough. Um, so Tyler, I did want to follow up with you. I had a question here that I wanted to make sure to ask you. Um, uh, how uh, can the experiences of parenthood and like different gender relationships 
um, that might look like they're not queer, um, how can you, like there's a challenge of bi erasure. Um, there's a challenge of representing the life that you're leading and having somebody gloss over the fact that you're not a straight woman. Um, how do you deal with that in your work and what kind of advice can you give to somebody who's wanting to make sure that their identities are not erased and they're not um, put in a box that they don't belong in um, without holding up a sign wherever they go? You know, how do you do it? Uh, I hold up a sign wherever <laughs> I go. <laughs> um, not exactly, but sort of. I think a lot of bi people do this where they, you end up kind of strategically dropping information to, you know, kind of say, yo, just so you know, it's not this, it's this, or this is part of my history and part of who I am. Um, in my work, it's just literally using my voice. My voice is what I, how I perceive the world is not the same as, um, M many of my heterosexual uh, peers, and that's the thing about parenting, is it's thrust me much more into a much more heterosexual environment than I'd lived most of my life. Mm. Um, so that's, that's been weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that'll enter a story at some point in that. But um, so really a lot of it's just purely presenting my point of view. I'm always, gender to me is a fascinating thing and I tend to think about it, especially since I have a kid and she's coming up into a very gendered world and that's a lot of what my comics are about, well, partially what my comics are about. Um, and a lot of it's just speaking up. Um, you know, there's a lot of, that's the other thing about bisexuality is there's a lot of presumptions from a mon monosexual point of view and that may mean um, hetero, but it might mean uh, gay people who, who also are very monosexual in their experience and point of view. Um, just kind of speaking up for other places. So yeah, it's speaking of, it's holding up the sign, mm -hmm. basically. But it, it's not just holding up the sign, it's just kind of talking from my place. Mm -hmm. um, but not everybody can hear it, yeah. that's okay. You know? So you just gotta continue, just gotta keep at it. Yeah, and you know, that's what I was joking earlier, part of the thing about being bi is you gotta keep coming out and keep coming out and keep mm -hmm. coming out because unless you do wear that pin that, yeah. you know, which, you know, back in when I was a young, you know, political, whatever, 20-something-year-old, <laughs> I did, but now I just, I don't, I don't like labels as much. Plus, I also, even the word bisexual, I've kind of dropped. I use it, it's a good political word, but it's trapped in the binary as well, so. Um, did you wear the pin all the time, or just was the pin? My favorite jacket with the pins. Okay. They even came up with, you know how there's the rainbow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They came up with a little three-colored triangle yeah, necklace yeah. thing that, you know, I yeah. hooked that on my leather jacket for a while. I used to have a little so rainbow long. pin I wore all the time because I've been told I'm apparently straight acting. So guys would, I had gay guys that told me after, like, oh, I thought you were cute or whatever, but they thought I was straight, so they never hit on me. So I started wearing a pin just yeah. specifically for <laughs> for these people. Exactly. Yeah. And, and because, you know, you get, you, people can, especially in, in subculture groups, people can really, they want to make sure you fit before you're allowed in the yes. door. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's yeah. that issue too. Mm -hmm. So it's again, not quite this, not quite that. Mm -hmm. Where do I find myself? Yeah. Yeah. I so, want to hear oh. more about the asexuals. Can you, yeah. <laughs> because I, we were on a panel once where um, somebody made some horrible crap kind of, um, comment about how like, well, if, it, if the book doesn't have sex in it, then it's an asexual book. Oh. <laughs> I don't well, think that's the right definition no, of it the is word. Not. <laughs> that is not at all. So. I don't know how to plug the asexuals in this case, but there's, there's not a lot of asexual visibility and there's, I guess it's just another pin. They have a really cool flag. It's like yeah. a gradient and then purple. Well, I have some friends who did a, a, a mini comic, which was a uh, asexual PSA. So oh. I'll get that to you, so you can so you okay. can read that. So I can share that with all of my mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. I do not I do not identify as asexual. Just for, <laughs> I I identify as a lesbian. And uh, Leia, who wrote Bold Riley, said that she she looked at me and she was like, "You look like a trap. You're like every." Um, <laughs> Every boy's manic pixie dream girl <laughs> dream. Because you love comics and you're uh, just so, ah. Oh. So, so you have to definitely wear the sign, wear the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, we've gotten to, I'm going to do questions in, in a bit. Um, so please be thinking about stuff you want to ask the panelists. 
um, especially if it's stuff about your work or about um, things that you've heard that you want to follow up on. Um, but I do, I'm really excited to ask you all about um, recommendations, recommendation time. So what is a really enjoyable, I'm not going to say your favorite, because that always makes people like freeze, but what is a really enjoyable queer comic that you think that, um, that a lot of people would really enjoy? I have lots of recommendations for mainstream comics because where I'm from, we don't have a lot of oh. cool, awesome Northwest Press type. Oh, that's fine. So I read a lot of superhero comics. Okay. And for those of you who like superhero comics, if you haven't read uh, Peter David's 2005 run of X Factor, which is one of the it was one of those Marvel like first gay kiss ever type <laughs> like made headlines. Um, that's one of the greatest story arcs I've ever read. Mm -hmm. So that one for sure. Okay. Um, when I was in that wonderful anthology you put out, Anything That Loves, I was flipping through it and I saw a comic from, a, a comic of Lillianne Bydyke, one mm -hmm. of her stories, and it just brought back all the love I had for her work. I found it, I think, seven, eight years ago online back when Everything was like on GeoCities pages and stuff. I mean, I don't think she she had one. She had an actual nice functional website, but I stayed up till 4 a.m. reading all of her, her whole archive, and I thought it was really fantastic because not only here was a character who was identifying as bisexual or, or ambiguously queer, she liked both men and women, but she also was not the stereotypical bisexual woman, which who tends to be portrayed as very like hyper feminine and attracted to other hyper feminine women and to masculine men, like. There's, for whatever reason, I found that bisexual women do not get a lot of um, depiction in popular media as being like more butch or being kind of genderqueer, what have you. And she definitely is like, I'm a dyke, but I'm also bi. So I thought that was really great. And she has fantastic narrative stories, and she's a great artist. You can tell, even though she has a really simple style, she has beautiful color work as well. Um, I guess. One of my favorite cartoonists is Linda Berry, and she's not a gay cartoonist or writes gay comics, but a lot of her comics have um, gay characters. Last year, um, John and Quarter Lee published a book called um, The Freddy Stories about um, a gay kid growing up in a, a, like a troubled family. A lot of the stories are kind of um, are dark, but um, there's like a light at the end of the tunnel in her stories, and I think I would recommend um, some of her stories as far as gay, she's, I kind of consider her as like the, I don't know if she's the godmother or something, but she's like the great auntie of gay comics or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, like Tony Breed's Finn and Charlie Get Hitched is really sweet. It's just so um, heartwarming. and, and uh, But also, um, Wendy Peeney's Elf Quest was something that when I was growing up was probably the only time, it was like for the longest time, that was it. There was nothing, and I don't know how she, we have asked her, like, how do you, how did you get away with, you know, doing this at, in the 70s and early 80s? And, and she's like, we just got, you know, she just snowed them with the big eyes, I guess. So, um, <laughs> but no, but there's so, she is, uh, she's a huge ally, and, um, and it just shows. And it's one of those things where it shows, and like your values transcend whatever story you're telling. You, the, you get a, um, you know exactly what they're talking about, even when, when they're not. So. All right. I, I was trying to think of what I've been reading recently. That I've been enjoying, and I, you know, what I was saying about trying to read outside of your own experience. I've been reading Cerebus from the beginning. I don't know if Dave Dave Sim is the most uh, queer. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who even knows Cerebus anymore. That's kind of going away, isn't it? He's not a fan of women. It's really not. Um, no. Um, okay, if you want to know, Google um, Dave Sims' Guide to Getting Chicks. It's written by Gail Simone back when she did a humor column on CBR. It is hysterical. Anyway. Yeah, if you, if you, actually, if you Google Gail Simone and Dale, Dave Sim, you could find some really entertaining uh, message board fights they had about five years ago that go on for hundreds of posts. Those are good. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's not, a, okay, queer comic recommendation. Um, Fox Bunny Funny. Oh, is yeah. really amazing, and for some reason I don't see it talked about much. But also, uh, you know what, this queer anthology, I, I have five pages in it, so I don't know if that means I can't recommend it, but there's also like 30 other great cartoonists. If you want gay comics, 
check out this because you'll discover like 30 amazing people all at once in one Queer book. Is great. So that's really good. <laughs> yeah, Queer is great because there, there's 33 creators and I like to say it's less than a dollar a creator. Um, <laughs> um, I, I tend to think more in terms of creators than books. I really like Annie Murphy's work a lot. Um, I find it really, she uses kind of a dreamy sensibility while also um, having some interesting historical narrative to her work. Um, Howard Cruz was a huge influence for me. Uh, Wendell was adorable, and um, was it Tim Barilla's? Uh, oh, Leonard and Larry. Leonard and Larry, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of Roberta Gregory, and she was a big influence also. Current work though, yeah, Annie Murphy. Um, Chris Dresden was on the scene for a really long time. Right now she's working on a long project, so she's off the scene. She also got really fed up for a while, so she's a, so um, it was hard to find her work. Let's see, God, there's so many, it's hard to pick people. Mm -hmm. Everybody at this everybody, table. Everybody, oh. Yeah, I just remembered uh, Robert Kirby. <laughs> no. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I was kidnapped by lesbian pirates from outer space. It was a favorite, although I'm not sure what happened to that comic because it ran into a whole bunch of publishing snafus. I think most of it is still up online to be read, and it's quite wonderful. Yeah, I think there was a it was an ownership issue. It was there was lots of kind of possibly shady or possibly yeah, just mistaken. Last, rights last I transfer. heard, yeah, the publisher she signed up with did. Didn't, wasn't paying her, wasn't really, you know, be playing fair, was not treating her right, but they had asked her to sign over all the publishing rights when she came on, and so she had no, no more creative control of the comic, and she said, that's it, I'm not doing yeah. it, I'm not finishing but, it. But Megan Gedris does really, really great um, comics on Tumblr, and you can just go and read those for free. She does really, really great um, kind of explorations of femininity and sexuality. She does burlesque and comics and it's just fascinating, and her work is very, very bold and very confrontational and really kick-ass, I love it. Also, um, as far as, yeah. as, far as uh, he, he does a lot of, the stories aren't necessarily queer-themed because he does a lot of stuff for big publishers, but anything that P. Craig Russell draws, mm -hmm. if, um, if you happen to like what I like, which is Pretty <laughs> Boys, the, the, it's, he's the best at drawing that. And I really love how he gets kind of queer vibe into mainstream comics. Cause like when I, I didn't know who he was the first time I read Sandman, like back in 99 or something. And when I got to the, the Ramadan issue 50 of Sandman, and there's the panel in there about the Sultan's boy harem, I didn't know who, boy Craig, who P. Craig Russell was or anything about it. I just knew that that panel was like seared into my 17 year old brain. <laughs> the best thing I ever saw in my life ever and, and then eventually after that I kind of I found out that he was gay and all that and um, you can see it in all of his stuff he did this horrible story called Robin 3000 that I, I've talked to him on Facebook about it apparently it was supposed to be like some sort of space Robinson Crusoe or something and then there was some publishing problem and then they changed it to Batman and Robin thing after he'd already drawn half of it and uh, he hates the story but if you go through there all the shots of the Robin that he does <laughs> in the whatever cave it's supposed to be practicing his gymnast poses and stuff just for, so you just don't read a single word balloon and it's the greatest comic. It's really amazing. So maybe they'll release a version where they just take out all the dialogue and story and just have it be Robin exercising for 200 pages. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he, you know, he's, I, I don't want to say that his comics are all, you can't read the word balloons, because that's not true at all. He's done some amazing comics. But that particular comics. one. But that particular one's a real piece of garbage with amazing drawings <laughs> of, of Robin in the Batcave doing handstands. Yeah. And The Authority. Everyone should read The Authority if you haven't read it. Only the very beginning of Only The Authority. Only the very beginning Only of The Warren Authority. Only Warren Ellis. It's, if you haven't, it's, uh, yes, Warren Ellis's arc. It's a Batman and Superman were actually together, if you ship that. Um, and then they have a kid. It's like the greatest thing ever, so. <laughs> yeah. Read that. Also, Ellen Forney's work. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so we are at the time of the panel where it is your turn to give your feedback, to, to ask your questions, to tell, take us on a path toward a topic that you want us to go. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, I gotta confess I'm not familiar with all of your work, but as an artist, I'd really love to hear about your process and either with your writing process or how you create the art. And you, and so you're, 
Yeah, so your writing process or your art process, how do you, um, how do, you do your work? How do you start and how do you complete your work? My uh, drawing process, you know, I saw Art Rem talk once and somebody asked him that question and he made fun of the person in the audience. He said, nobody wants to hear about that. But I thought, I really want to hear about that. I wish he would have just answered the question. So if anybody's curious, because I think that, not that I like have so much to teach people, but I think it's really interesting when artists I know talk about what they use. Um, I ink with a Windsor & Newton Series 7 brush, a one, a small one, which people told me I was too small, but then I read that Dave Sim also uses a one, so I was like, yeah, that's right. And um, uh, I do the lettering with a rapidograph pen, um, and the small details with like a, a Hunt 107 Croquel, if that's you, interesting to anybody. And your coloring is? Did My coloring is all digital. Mm -hmm. If the gray tones are done with ink washes, I just thin out the the ink that I use with water. Yeah, and the ink tones came out really nice in the in the new book. They do, I was they, really happy. The it's those. whatever printer the Zan uses now. He's printing beautiful books. The gray tones and things come out perfect, crisp. Mm -hmm. I will tell you their name if you mention me <laughs> when you go to them. Uh, it's it's Marquis in uh, in Quebec. They do really really great work. Great work. Um, I forgot to mention my website, it, um, Agent Agnes, if you wanted to look me up. But um, my process with comics, um, traditionally, the big publishers, like they have a separate person write a script, and then the artist gets the script, and then they do the, the drawings based on that. And the script frequently will say, like, this panel, this happens, this panel, this happens. And I tried, when I was starting out, I tried writing scripts, and it just could, did not work. I couldn't do it. I have to draw a thumbnail of each panel and write the dialogue in where it goes. Like I have to have a visual, re I see it in my head what's happening, so I have to have a visual representation first. So I draw all these tiny little boxes on a page, which is covered with little boxes with the writing actually written in. And sometimes it's so small I have trouble reading it. And I number each one of these panels. And then I make separate drawings of page layouts where I put in the panels, numbered them to figure out what size they're gonna be and how big they're gonna be and how many are gonna be on the page. And then I get the big piece of paper and I draw the panels on them and then I pencil it and then I ink it, then I scan it, then I clean it up, then I format it for the web and then I format it for publishing as well. So each page takes about eight to 12 hours on like my nicer comics. Um, so it's pretty involved, but I do absolutely everything from start to finish. I think some people, I've seen them, they're able to just draw the whole page in thumbnail format. Like they, they see the panels and the dialogue and it's, or they just get a big piece of paper and they just start drawing, but that's pretty impossible for me. I think there's just a lot of different approaches for how you structure things. Yeah, I can't just throw something down. Um, I work in a really layered process. I, I tend to, I don't always, can't always sit down to work whenever I want to work, so I keep something I call the seed book where I jot down story ideas or quick thumbnails or bits and pieces of something as it grows, because often when I'm writing something, I'm more like growing it and I'm gestating on it for days or weeks or months. Um, and then I just throw bits of it down while I can. And then when I get a chance, when I have, feel like I have enough, I'll clean it up, I'll do, I'll rough it. And that's where I bring clarity to how the story is gonna be told. And then from the roughs, I do really tight pencils. And then from the pencil, and pencils, I do the inks. Um, my Primazons, I ink entirely in color. Uh, I'm using Waterproof India inks and washes. Um, the Mama Pants stories, I ink uh, with black ink and then I color in Photoshop. I only use brush. I cannot stand quills. I've used them in the past, but they're just, to me, it's a big relationship between the brush and the paper. Um, so for like the color work I'm working on, water, watercolor paper, even though it's India inks, and how the ink flows into the paper is really essential to the process and how the light responds between the pigment and the, I, I, I will geek out on it for a while, so I'll, I'll, I'll quit. Um, and then I, yeah, I scan it in, I arrange it in InDesign. Um, and I, the first couple issues, I, no, yeah, I lettered with um, digitally. I found a couple fonts I could live with. 
um, not comic sans. <laughs> uh, but now I've started lettering by hand after people kept saying I got a letter by hand. And for that I like using a Japanese calligraphy pen because it gives a variable line weight that works well with my very brush marky style of art. I also like to sketch with them for the same reason. Actually, one I have to say about the Comic Sans, I saw a really great t-shirt uh, at Denver Comic Con that said Helvetica, and it was written in Comic Sans. It was the most frustrating thing I'd ever seen. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I always start with a script. Not I do not break it down into panels because I'm like a pacing, I'm all about pacing for comics. So I start with a concept, and my thesis is actually a musical, so that's like a whole other bag of cats. But the Brohime is it's an idea, and then I write vaguely what the bros are going to say, and then I run it past my brother to make sure that bros would actually say that. <laughs> and then <laughs> I do tiny your thumbnails. Your bro search. My bro, yes, he's my like a Brit picker. He's my bro picker. Um, uh, I do a tiny thumbnail and then I draw it on the big fanboy, which I hate the name of the paper, but it's better than the Strathmore because it doesn't suck the ink in like the, anyway, technical stuff. Um, and then I do blue pencils, I sketch it in real quick and then I ink it straight with uh, Croak, I'm a Croak Quill person. And uh, I use a 104, which is the smallest nib you can get. So, and then Photoshop on the web. Done. Um, well, I guess my process is um, very similar to what Agnes mentioned. Um, I do like have ideas and I just um, rough it out, draw really loosely and draw in text. And then eventually I get to the point where I, you know, do tight pencils and, and add the final text. And I want to say that um, a lot of um, like my process work and even Ashley's work is on um, display actually at the CCA gallery. Um, and I have a bunch of like um, early sketches um, and things like that. It's, I'm very much a process person, so I like seeing that. So I put it up there. So I have a bunch of like just really raw sketches and even stuff like on yellow um, legal paper just up there. Cause that's sometimes, you know, it's wh wherever you get the idea and whatever you have, that's what you start with. Well, I love process, so I used to go around and just ask everybody, just down the line of the artist alley, what they ink with, and it was just really, it was like everywhere, every, all over the board. But um, I, I plot pretty tightly, but I don't script first, and then I sketch in a sketchbook, and then I lightbox those onto my Bristol boards, and then I ink with a brush, mostly, some crow quill if I want something like a brittle, like rocks or something. And then I script afterwards in um, uh, Illustrator and do digital, coloring in, in Photoshop. Yeah. Uh, and I will say, for, for those of you who uh, are, are not writer artists who are uh, writing scripts for, for artists to work from, um, the, the tricks that I always do, I haven't done a lot of scripting in a while. Uh, I wrote uh, the anti-bullying book that we put out, The Power Within. I wrote the script for an artist for that. And I wrote the scripts for The Mark of Iacus, which is an uh, erotic thriller adventure series. Um, the best trick that I ever learned for uh, comics writing, especially writing for somebody else, uh, um, is to take a piece of lined paper. Uh, a comic book is probably gonna be 24 pages average, like a regular size comic. Um, write one through 24 down your list of, in your paper and describe what's happening on that page. Just one quick sentence, one line is all you get. Uh, and you'll, your pacing will become very clear to you. Because if, you, if it just says, they're talking, they're talking, they're talking, they're talking, they're talking, maybe they could be doing something else instead of just talking. Um, and also you'll see where things are dragging, um, uh, unless it's, uh, or maybe it will, it will, you know, it'll, it'll be clear to you that you're making the right choices. That's also possible. Like you'll see, oh, well, I imagine it this way and it actually really works. Um, so I really, really recommend that because what that does is it's a very low bar um, to write a single sentence about what's happening on a page. You can do that. You can feel a sense of first draftness. And then from that point on, you can take that one line and expand it further. Uh, and then you break it down into your panels and then you break it down into your angles and your shots, and your dialogue and all that stuff. So um, that's the best advice I can give you for comics writers because that's saved me uh, um, every time I try to do a script. So. 
It's another question in the audience. In the back with the lovely rainbow. Rainicorn. Rain, rain, what was that? Rainicorn. That's beautiful. Oh, lady Rainicorn. Yay. I love it. What is your question? Oh, so being an out queer cartoonist, did anybody publish their first work under pseudonyms? Do you use pseudonyms now? Are you who you say you are? What's going on? Actually, I, I always, when I was little, I hated my name, and so I always thought when I was a famous writer, I'd use a fake name. And then I started posting my comics on my own MySpace yeah. with my own name, because they were just for my friends, and then published a book of those, and they had my name, I wrote my name on them. So it's yeah. kind of too late. What name would you have picked? I, you know, I never like came up with Reginald that. Steele or something like that. <laughs> Probably not that. No, okay. my, my mom, when I was little, wanted to call me before I was born, wanted to call me Chip, and my, my dad, yeah, my dad had to fight her out of that, so we could have used Chip. Chip but no, Chip it's, uh, I just got stuck with the whole Rick Worley bit. Okay. Um, when I was in college, uh, one of the things that they had us do was make a promotional website, and I was like, and they encouraged us to use our real names as part of the URL, I think, just to make it easy for people, and also so that they don't make a mistake of making some really terrible URL they're stuck with later. And I was like, there's no way people will spell my last name right, because it's spelled C-Z-A-J-A, -A. so I'm like, I need to come up with something clever that still has Agnes, so I came up with Agent Agnes, and then I figured it would be easiest just to send my work that way, because again, people would be misspelling my name, typing it into Google and whatnot. Um, so that's, for a while my work was coming out under that, but then when I would do things like panels and whatnot, and I don't know, somehow at some point along the way I really wanted my real name to be on it. Like, I'm, I, being out was not a concern for me at all at this point, so um, definitely been there. However, with the pornographic work, that's a little bit different, and I kind of struggle with that, because on the one hand, like, everybody in the, especially in the queer cartoon scene, but a lot of the other comic scenes I've been in, like, they do not give a hoot about what you do or kind of material you do. But, you know, if my mom's typing my name into Google or whatever, you know, <laughs> I don't necessarily want that popping up. So I have used a pseudonym on the books, but I've also put them on my websites and everybody knows they're mine. And I put them in, like, my online shop and whatnot. So it's kind of like a, a very flimsy, <laughs> you know, um, trying to have a, an alias but not really being very good about keeping it secret. My work's mine. <laughs> um, and, you know, out is not an issue to me. It's part of the whole point of being out. Um, but it was recommended to me that uh, if my stuff, there's a lot of naked boobies and stuff in my <laughs> work. It's not sexual, it's just a lot of nudity. And so someone was saying that if I did want to publish children's work, I may want to think about having a different name to, and I, I guess for people who do really pornographic work, maybe this is a concern, just to differentiate your audiences, just to not have kids going to your website and seeing things, but I've had kids read my comics and they like them, you know, but that's also, I could see in certain parts of this country, certain parents having a complete tweak out over it so you know but well, I'm, know, not, I'm not catering to them I know that uh, Leanne Franson uh, that you mentioned Agnes um, she um, was doing a lot of illustration work and for for younger readers uh, projects and was trying to somehow separate it, and I imagine it was a very difficult process trying to separate her Lillian Bydyke comic from that other work because she didn't want there to be a potential conflict and um, yeah, so if you're doing work, even if it's not autobiographical, but, but just not a good fit for the kind of work that you're trying to get, yeah, I can see that that separation might be really important. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult thing because when you're building up your audience and your, your sort of cachet and your networking in one area, you want to use that to like springboard all of your work. And if you have a new alias and you're trying to keep your work separate, it's almost like starting from scratch. It's like you're trying to get two careers off the ground. It, mm -hmm. I think it makes it much harder. Yeah. Another question. Yes. Um, for writing, when you want to do characters who have identities that are just drastically different from your own, how do you research that so that you don't make them like a pastiche or, or a, a caricature? So writing characters different read from yourself a, to read make them a realistic. Lot. Read, there's a BuzzFeed article I actually had to read for class recently um, called Writing the Other, 12 Steps to it's like 12 steps to writing the other. And it like step number three is like, know that you suck. 
And so, <laughs> and like, you're gonna probably create the most stereotypical caricature of something before you realize what it is. And finding people as resources to write characters, one of our fellow um, MFA people who will go unnamed, wrote a female character mostly about her and it was the most misogynistic, pornographic comic. And he thought it was like an ode to her, like her <laughs> life story. And I was like, well, you wouldn't show her like that in the shower then. Like, you know, so you can imagine what it looked like. But definitely use your resources. Like if you're writing a woman or someone who identifies as a woman, talk to the women, you know. And not just one. And not just one. <laughs> Lots of them. I think um, consuming a lot of authentic media about those characters. So go find movies, books, TV shows, YouTube channels, autobiographies, whatever it is, put out by the people you want to represent that's also recommended by the people you want to represent. Like you want to have all the authoritative voices from that community behind this work as you know, an authentic, real, honest, fair representation. Use that, don't just like go, you know, watch a Tyler Perry movie and be like, no, I can write a black character. You know, you need like a whole variety of experiences and a whole variety of um, authentic voices from any community you want to represent. And don't be afraid to write them as a real person because there's also that challenge of like, oh, I'm gonna make this character, my main character's gonna be black and he's gonna be the most perfect Sydney Poitier man ever. But there's also harm in that because is that a real person? You have to definitely... Yeah, put their humanity first. Right, humanity way, first yeah, and yeah. then everything yeah. else. You could write a well-rounded character, like sort of based on your film, and then be like, well, what if they were a woman? Or what if they were from a foreign country or whatever, you know? Yeah, I think the, the thing, the way to do it is to, if you're including the character that you have no real frame of reference, no way of identifying with besides through secondhand experience reading things secondhand, um, you're going to be including that character because you want to show their humanity, you want to show them as a person. You're doing all the research to avoid pitfalls. You're doing it so that you don't make it a stereotype. So right. it's like uh, the, the research is for what not to do right. in many ways. There's, so there's a, there's a trick that a lot of people uh, like to do. Sometimes it's just fun, sometimes it's actually useful in the work. Um, to write uh, a story, I feel like if you're having men and women in a story, write your story uh, and then get a draft of it and then switch the genders. And don't change anything. Change as little as you possibly can and see what you've done. <laughs> um, uh, there's a really good example out in theaters now. It's, a, it's otherwise a good movie, but I think it would be vastly improved by doing just that with the two leads. Uh, Emily Blunt and Tom Cruise should be absolutely switched in the Edge of Tomorrow sci-fi movie because um, it, it would be a great opportunity for a, uh, a, a woman character to be introduced uh, to have her, like to have the audience, maybe a sci-fi audience might have an expectation that she would be the weaker character, she would be, you know, need to be supported, she need to be whatever. And at the beginning you have a little bit of that, but by the end of it she is the savior of the world in, in, the, in the switched version. Um, and, and grows and becomes like, she's not trinity she's not like the Trinity Syndrome where she's like the badass girl who exists to like help the, the, the hapless dude save the world. Um, and, uh, and it would just make so much more sense. It also plays on the whole Tom Cruise mythic, super like uh, box office ideal thing. There's, that would be great to play with in the movie. I'm sure he just vetoed that. If anybody ever brought that up, like, no, I'm gonna be the guy who saves the world. Um, That's why, uh, Speaking of Tom Cruise, yes. uh, Pacific Rim, the movie Pacific Rim, uh -huh. they thought about casting Idris, uh, Idris Elba's character as Tom Cruise, and then Guillermo del Toro was like, no, let's make it Idris Elba. And I yeah. think it's a much better movie oh, yeah. for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and you know, Ripley wasn't, ca you know, wasn't created as a female character. Right. And uh, there's a great uh, Angelina Jolie movie, well, is a, there's a good Angelina Jolie movie uh, <laughs> called Salt, which is actually going to be a Tom Cruise vehicle. And she stepped into the role with very little changes. And it's wonderful. Just yeah. to, It's so refreshing to see a character being as complicated and being as interesting and being as um, free from expectations of gender as possible. 
um, because it becomes so fresh and so new, and it, it's just it's just nice. I like it. That's what yeah I was gonna say Ripley because it wasn't written that way, mm -hmm. and you can you wouldn't think it when you watch it, but you realize afterwards that that's why it's so great. Yeah. And in the second even the the second Aliens is good and everything, but but you do notice that they felt the need to talk about oh how her daughter she has a daughter it's back on Earth and now she's got to be a mom to Newt and it's all about you, you know they have to they have to make a third of the movie about her uterus. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, it's her movie, she almost gets raped. Oh, that yeah, yeah, there the has whole to be third a rape movie, in there somewhere. It's like, oh no, she's a woman in a prison colony, what happens now? And that becomes like the whole plot of, the th well, the third movie's garbage. The, sec the second one's okay, but it's still, they still feel like they have to address the fact that yeah. she's a woman and, and yeah. they have to justify it As in some way. her being a person. Right, right, right. They have to. They have to. Oh well, she's a person, but she's also a woman. It's kind of <laughs> whoa. <laughs> Another question. Push, push, yes. Push. Questions. Questions. I'll just pick somebody. I'm just gonna pick somebody. Yes, in the back. What kind of merchandise and swag has worked out for you? What are the hot, hot, hot phenomenons that you've created? Uh, well, I. I we did that one T-shirt, Zan and I. That uh, it was it was intended as my um, parody of the the Peanuts "Happiness Is a Warm Puppy" uh, book, and it like I, Lucy hugging Snoopy or something. Yeah, Lucy was hugging Snoopy, and so I you know, in my comic I, I had a joke where I said, "Happiness is a boy who swallows," and I had my my rabbit hugging this guy that I was dating, and we did a T-shirt of that that was. Yeah. The happiness is a boy who swallows got yeah. pretty popular, but I would see you know I'd see this like on blogs. I saw it like on a, a L.A. nightlife blog with like pictures of some gay club and people wearing it. And then I realized that they probably like the shirt, but they have no idea about my comics. So it just kind of I don't really know what a success it was, except as a shirt. Mm -hmm. Well, but I love when uh, when straight women would buy that. I just <laughs> love that because they're gonna like you know bring this home and the and and be wearing it and be like yeah you know be like, like, oh yes. That's so great. Can you <laughs> yeah. subtle hint? Okay. Um, the, the, uh, there was a Kickstarter that we did for the Anything That Loves uh, book, which is all about uh, sexuality outside of gay and straight. And um, uh, at a panel discussion, somebody asked a question and, and uh, prefaced it with, I define my sexuality as wibbly wobbly, uh, which is the perfect intersection of like uh, total nerdery and, um, and sexual progressiveness. And um, so we made, uh, as part of the Kickstarter rewards, we made a, a T-shirt that is three check boxes: gay, straight, and wibbly wobbly, sexy wexy. And uh, that came, that that took off like crazy. Um, like the it keeps getting posted on Doctor Who things. And uh, like again, like Rick was saying, I get like sixty thousand shares of it, and none of them have a link back to buy it. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, and you know, it's so frustrating when you see these like people posting the "shut up and take my money" image over and over and over again. I'm like. It's crickets. I don't hear any orders coming in. You're not really saying, take my money, Amy. No. But it's a like phenomenon. That. It's great. It's working out great. Um, I, I haven't ventured very far into the merchandising field, and I, uh, but I know that prints, uh, little prints, are very popular. I've sold a lot of those, just little color printouts of my work. You can actually use services like Shutterfly or even Walgreens.com to order those little photo prints like you would order photos for an album. And then you can pick them up at your local Walgreens. I think Shutterfly is actually a really great quality service, and they're really cheap and fast, so I'd use them. But I, these tiny things, they cost me something ridiculous, like 40 cents or 70 cents, and I sell them for $3 or like 4 for 10 or something. And so it's a pretty big profit margin, and it's such a small expenditure for people, but something cute and pretty, and they can put it in an album where they collect things they can put on their wall, they can give it to somebody. So those have been really good. The, um, well, with outlawing plastic bags and San Francisco totes have been really, really big. And it's become like the punk rock t-shirt or you, you know, you can get to express your personality. Because nobody wants to walk around with a Trader Joe's bag. So. Yeah. We actually, uh, the Northwest Press uh, has totes that we, we don't have them this uh, show because we ran out because they are so popular. Uh, but we give them away with every, every book sale. So they're not really like a, a merchandise thing of themselves, but they, People are like, I want to buy something just to get that tote. And it's just, a, it says comics are for everyone. Uh, and we actually have uh, some stickers that just came in uh, yesterday. So we have some stickers of that. Um, but the new one is actually going to have an illustration uh, by Terry Blass, which is going to be a whole bunch of different people reading comics and loving comics. And it's going to have the same tagline. So uh, a bag definitely is really good. And you can get them really cheaply. Um, you can get like the, the non-woven kind of recyclable material bags. So 
And you could live with that. That box collapses down real good. So you can yes, live, you're yes. not living with giant, giant boxes in yes. your living room. Another question from the audience. Yes. Who has collaborated with artists and writers and figured out all the, the mucky muck? I try to avoid it, but, it, but it's yeah. like a three or four year commitment for the artist. So it's, um, I've turned down some projects because they wanted, pre, even like with the originals, they wanted like a cut of if I sold any of my originals or even made a print from because it was didn't, it was connected to the story, so um, it's it is smart to work it all out beforehand, especially for the for the artist. Mm -hmm. When you, uh, you have sorry, no, you have to decide if you want it to be like a true collaboration and find someone who really believes in your project as much as you do, or you have to decide if you have the script if you want to pay the artist like per page of drawing. So yeah. that's like a whole that would be a more of a legal thing. Yeah. Well, also there's, I mean, as, as a publisher, I publish a lot of people um, who are doing completed projects. Like I, most of the stuff we're getting is submitted uh, complete. It's not, I have a script and I want to get a, an artist. So I don't assemble creative teams is the phrase that I use a lot. Um, but uh, in terms of paying people, like anybody who's working in comics, uh, anybody who's drawing comics, um, I think it's immoral not to pay them something. Uh, and if you pay them a small amount, you have to be very aware that it's still a favor that they're doing for you. Um, so that can make it very tricky when you're starting out if you're doing a new project, if, if it's your first project, for instance, um, because you, you don't want people to, you don't want someone to have to give their time to you, because the writing process is usually the shorter of the two uh, parts of the project. So um, what I did with uh, the Mark of Vieques, which was the first kind of series we tried to do uh, with the artist. Um, he, his job was art and my job was everything else. And so I did the writing, but then I also did all the lettering. I also did all of the uh, pre-production. I also worked with the printer. I also you know, did all the press and did all the handling, all that stuff. Um, so I tried to take on as many responsibilities as I could do to make it more equitable. And then we were able to just kind of agree that the project was completely owned 50-50. But if I had just been, if I'd been the writer and co-creator, um, it would have not felt reasonable to split it evenly because there's the, the division of labor. Just It's just the fact that the division of labor is not equal. So. Yeah, I agree with Zan. And I heard somebody say once that uh, writers will always need artists way more than artists need writers. Anybody who's a comic artist probably wants to get published on their own. They probably have their own story ideas and whatnot. And so... Um, a lot of us will prioritize our own stuff way before we agree to work with anybody else. And drawing the art is just so much, I mean, no offense to writers, writing is a craft and it's an art, but it, drawing is uh, putting the whole thing together. I mean, when like you heard me talking about my process, the thumbnails and the pencils and the inks and the scanning and cleaning it up and all that kind of stuff. That's hours and hours of work. And it's, I think, a lot more physical work than writing. So you definitely need to provide some kind of other incentive for the mm -hmm. artist to work with you. Kind of like Zan talked about, where you say, oh, I'm going to also do the cleanup and the layout, and I'm going to put it on the web, and I'm going to do promotion or whatever to make it more equitable if you aren't able to pay an artist, which most individual people aren't. Uh, at least not anything that's you know that an artist would be able to live off of. So unfortunately, it is very difficult for somebody who can only do writing to find a true partner that they can work with on a creative project. Yeah, you have to love them because you're going to be with them forever. It's yeah. like having a child with somebody, and then even if you divorce, you still have to. You know. <laughs> yeah. well, and that's part of it is figuring out whether you can understand each other's language, because um, anyone who's creating a story, they have a voice of some kind. And so if you're doing a collaboration, can, can, is it, does it work as a relationship? Do you understand each other? Um, to add on to what Agnes was saying about the amount of time involved, I am involved with, I'm illustrating, I'm not cartooning, but illustrating a book right now that's going to come out next year. It's a collaboration. Um, and it's 
taken over all my studio time for, well, the, this entire past spring, and I, it's just making me, it's, I started getting irritable by the end of it because I'm like, I need to get to my work. Mm -hmm. um, so it really has to be worth your time. Yeah. Well, one, uh, one good uh, tip I would recommend for artists who are uh, wanting, to, wanting to get uh, a project off the ground and want to work with an artist, um, uh, because of Kickstarter and because of kind of that pre-sale model where you can, um, you can basically pay for your, your, your cost of your book ahead of time and kind of guarantee it and get that going, uh, one of the things you really absolutely need to do if you do a Kickstarter to fund your new project is uh, build in a way to give excess, um, uh, like above and beyond what you expect, excess profits or excess monies to the artists um, in a significant way and make sure that the more successful the project is, the more money the artists get. Um, because even in a, like Anything That Loves, we did a Kickstarter for that and um, all the artists um, essentially donated their work um, the, the book was, uh, the, the royalties for the book is all, they all go to Prism Comics. And so it's been a money maker for them to help them do the grant and their, their, their activities and whatever. Um, but even that, that said, um, I wanted to pay a, a page rate to the, the artists. And so when we exceeded our goals, uh, I was able to scale that up higher and higher and higher and everybody got paid pretty, pretty significantly by the end, especially folks who did a very, very long contribution to it. So definitely think about that. Make sure that you're, you're respecting their time and respecting their, uh, their work and, and valuing them. So. Oh, and one more thing I wanted to add too is I, I don't want to discourage anyone from trying to do this. If you are a writer, it's just that it can be very difficult, not just because of money issues, but because when you're an artist and any project you work on, you start feeling like protective of it. You start feeling like an owner. Even if it's not your work and somebody else's script, it still feels like, oh, this is my creation. And so the editorial process gets very difficult. It's very difficult for somebody you feel like is supposed to be your equal on this telling you, no, this is wrong, change this, this doesn't look right, this needs to be different. Because we start feeling like, well, but I'm creating this too, and this is how I'm doing it, I'm doing the art. So it's, it's a very difficult process, not just because of the money, but because you have to negotiate how much power each of you gives up and what editorial say you have in the project. And you have to work that out and set those expectations right at the beginning and make sure everybody's okay and on the same page. And also if it's, um, well, it depends on the type of comic and it depends on your relative drawing ability, but unless it's something that really requires, you know, really fantastical elaborate drawings, if you have a script and it's, your project's really based in the writing, try to draw it yourself. Yeah, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter if you're, there's a lot of great cartoonists that like technically aren't very good illustrators. Yes. They just can't draw that well. But the point is that you can tell your story and you know what the jokes are, you know where the panels need to be and you know what you need to see, you know what it means. Um, and you know, especially like in newspaper comics, two thirds of those guys can't draw, but they can tell their joke and that's what's important. So you know, I really give it, give it a shot of drawing it yourself if you have a story you really want to tell. Our program director at the California College of the Arts has an, an Eisner-nominated book, and he cannot draw a lick. <laughs> and he used the most extensive photo references I've ever seen for a book. And it's phenomenal because the story is good, and that's what comics are about. So. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm so glad we had this time together uh, <laughs> to share a laugh and sing a song. Is that how it goes? Um, so I'm going to take this crew down uh, or up up to the fifth floor to the uh, Northwest Press booth. Uh, and we're all going to be available for you to, to talk with us and uh, sign books and check out what, they, what they've done and see their work. Uh, and ask them more questions in private and hit on them and whatever. Uh, and uh, um, and I, wanted to, I want to thank you guys for coming. Uh, this has been a great long conversation. I love that we had time to stretch out and, and really dive in depth with stuff. And thank all, thanks to all the panelists for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.